I'm Nathan Rutherford, and welcome to Myth Madness. It's time to talk a little bit about centaurs. In today's pop culture, the entities from Greek mythology that are often considered bad guys are the Titans, the Cyclopses, and the god Hades. But in ancient Greece, It is the centaurs, perhaps surprisingly, who are the recurring antagonists of the heroes. The reason being was, even though Kronos and the Titans represented an old, overthrown universal order, and the god Hades was feared due to his association with death, the centaurs were considered uncouth barbarians living in the wild places of the Greek world, waiting around that tree over there, or behind that big rock, ready to steal the women and bash you over the head. Centaurs were dangerous. They were fierce, violent, lecherous, and prone to getting drunk and getting into trouble. Numerous heroes got into fights with them. Heracles had several run-ins with them, and one centaur eventually caused his death. But that wasn't the biggest conflict between humans and centaurs. There was even a centaur war. In it, the half-horse creatures fought against an equally fierce human tribe called the Lapiths, led by a hero named Pirithous. Pirithous is an interesting character in Greek mythology. He is not well known, but it's clear he was important to the ancient Greeks. He was related by blood to a handful of Greek Argonauts, and was also closely tied to the adventures of Theseus. Many of Pirithous's adventures relate to trying to find a wife, and one of these gets him into some serious trouble with the antagonist centaurs. Before getting to the war, first a little bit about the origins of the centaurs and the lapiths. Greek mythology gives us two different origins for the half-man, half-horse centaurs. In a more run-of-the-mill version, Diodorus of Sicily reports that Apollo seduced the nymph Stilbe. Her two sons were Lepithes and Centauros. Lepithes was the founder of a tribe of men, the lapiths. Centauros who was the ugly brother, mated with a herd of wild female horses, and so became the founder of a race of half-horse, half-man hybrids, the centaurs. The other version is more complicated, more interesting, and appears in multiple Greek sources, the earliest being Pindar in the 5th century BC. This tradition starts with the tribe of Lapiths, specifically with their king, Ixion. This Ixion, like a few different kings of Greek mythology, was a favorite of Zeus. He was also, like a lot of kings in Greek myth, not a good guy. Zeus invited Ixion to Olympus to join a feast with the gods, and the king spent the entire time lusting after Hera. So, Zeus set out to test the king and created a body double out of clouds that looked exactly like Hera. Thinking it was the queen of heaven, Ixion raped the cloud woman in Hera's own bedroom. Zeus then punished Ixion for his crime by tying him to a large flaming wheel that turned for all eternity. What happened to the cloud body double? Well, it seems that she was not just some inanimate mannequin, but was actually conscious, which does make the whole using her as bait thing incredibly problematic. After the rape, the cloud woman, named Nepheli, which literally means cloud, gave birth to Centauros, who went on to father the centaurs. Both these stories are quite different, but they do share one key thing. They both show a family relationship between the Lapiths and the centaurs. This is an important detail, and I'll come back to it in a moment. Both of these groups went on to live in Thessaly. For now, I'll switch gear and introduce the Lapiths. The Lapiths were not just a tribe living on the outskirts of Greece. They were a group of powerful warriors, known for their skills as horsemen. The Lapiths were considered the inventors of horse bridles, and the horses they rode were actually the offspring of their distant cousins, the centaurs. An army of Lapiths joined the Greeks who would later sail to Troy. Several of them were also heroes in their own right, with adventures of their own. These main Lapith heroes are divided into two tighter families within the larger clan. Within one family, the Lapith Elatus had four children named Ishes, Ampicus, Polythemus, 
and Canis. Ischis was a lover of a woman named Coronis. Unfortunately for him, she was also a lover of the god Apollo, and was already pregnant with his son. When Apollo found out about the second relationship, he was furious. Either he or Zeus killed Ischis. Apollo's sister, Artemis, killed Coronis. Apollo rescued the unborn child, and he became the healer hero, Asclepius. The other sons of Alatus fared a bit better. Ampicus had the gift of prophecy. He was the father of another Lapith seer named Mopsus. This is the same Mopsus who joined Jason in his quest for the Golden Fleece. The Lapith Polyphemus also joined the Argonauts' adventure. Polyphemus was considered one of the strongest men in the world. He was married to a half-sister of the hero Heracles. The final child of Alatus was a daughter named Canis. Unlike her brothers, we have a nice detailed myth about Canis, with multiple sources, and it goes at least as far back as the 6th century BC. It goes like this. Canis was a beautiful girl who had received multiple offers of marriage. She repeatedly turned them all down. One day, she found herself walking along the seashore. There, she encountered the god Poseidon. The ruler of the sea either raped Canis or struck a bargain with her. Either way, afterwards, she asked him to turn her into a man, but not just any man, an invincible man. The reason why she wanted to be a man strongly suggests she was raped. The versions are slightly different, but what they say about why she wants to be a man range from she doesn't want to give birth to Poseidon's child to she never wanted to be assaulted again. Poseidon at least granted her wish. The ruler of the sea turned Canis into a man with skin invulnerable to weapons. Canis was now Canius, and would go on to become a skilled and decorated warrior. Later, Canius had a son named Coronis. This Coronis also joined Jason and the Argonauts, like his uncle and cousin. Those are some of the main Lapiths. There are more, but they are mostly names. In the 7th century BC, Hesiod lists the names of approximately eight Lapiths. Centuries later, Ovid lists over twice as many. Besides the sons of Alatus, the most important Lapith was the son of the king Ixion I mentioned before. This man was the Greek hero Pirithous. In the myths, Pirithous is considered the son of Ixion, although, as far back as Homer's Iliad, he is given a second, immortal father. According to Homer, Ixion's wife was impregnated by Zeus in the form of a horse. But as the son of Ixion, Pirithous was a prince among the Lapiths, and with the imprisonment of his father in Tartarus for trying to rape Hera, Pirithous was now king. A fierce warrior, and now the master of a number of other fierce warriors, Pirithous was always going to build a name for himself. At the same time, another heroic man had also risen to the kingship of a powerful city nearby. That man was Theseus. The king of Athens already had a reputation for strength and bravery. He cleared the Attica countryside of bandits, sacrificed the Marathonian bull, and of course slayed the Minotaur. Pirithous decided to test the Athenian skills. Pirithous went and raided Theseus's cattle, driving them away. Theseus heard about this and went to hunt for this bandit stealing his livestock. But when he finally caught up with the man, instead of running, Pirithous turned back and met him, ready to duel. Both men stood at opposite ends of a small field and looked at each other, admiring one another's daring. They did not fight. Instead, Pirithous walked slowly over and held out his hand. He declared that Theseus should be the judge of his robbery, and he told the Athenian king he would accept any penalty for the crime. But Theseus did not punish the cattle rustler. Instead, he did what only ancient Greek kings could do. He purified Pirithous of his guilt and invited him to be his friend and brother in arms. From then on, Pirithous and Theseus would be best friends. The adventures of the two heroes will continue to overlap, in some traditions, they both joined the hunt for the Caledonian boar together, although they did not kill the huge animal themselves. Several examples of Greek vase art also have them traveling together to the land of the Amazons. Later, Pirithous was to marry a woman named Didymia. 
Sometimes she goes by other names, such as Hippodamia. Who she is exactly is not going to end up being an important detail, but what happens at their wedding certainly will. All of the Lapiths were invited to their king's wedding, and likely Didamia's family too. Pirithous also invited his friends from outside the tribe, including Theseus. But like a lot of bride and grooms, Pirithous invited a whole other group that he maybe didn't want to invite, and certainly regretted it later. That group were the centaurs. Since they were related to the Lapiths through Ixion, they were part of the extended family, and for that reason probably received their invitations. The earliest surviving accounts of the wedding are nestled within the Iliad and the Odyssey. In the Odyssey poem, Homer points out that wine is many a man's undoing, when he gulps his draught and never drinks discreetly. Like with many weddings, wine would prove to be the cause of the drama at Pirithous's. But this time, there weren't any drunk grandmas or groomsmen telling embarrassing stories. According to Homer, wine darkened the wits of the guest Eurydian the centaur, and in his frenzy, he did monstrous things in the palace hall of Pirithous. We don't get the details on what exactly Eurydian the centaur did, but we do get the Lapith's response. The human heroes leapt up from their seats, grabbed hold of the centaur, and escorted him out of the palace doors. But they didn't just kick him out of the wedding. Out in the courtyard, they cut off his ears and nose before turning him loose. From Eurydian's drunken actions and the Lapith's brutal retribution, a great feud with the centaurs was born. Several later sources elaborate on what the drunk Eurydian did, and also expand it to the whole group of centaurs. The centaurs as a group got drunk on the wine, became rowdy, and laid their hands on the Lapith women. The Lapith men pulled out their weapons and fought against the centaurs. Humans and centaurs were slain at the wedding, and others were killed in a war and ran out of the country. The Roman poet Ovid provides the most detailed and the most gory account. In his version, the sounds of festive merrymaking rang through the palace halls. Wedding hymns were sung, the fireplaces roared with flame, cups clinked and overflowed with drink, some cups more than others. Like in Homer, Eurydian, who Ovid calls Eurytos, is the fiercest of the already impressive centaurs. He quickly became fired up by the drink and with lust for the bride. Tables were flipped, and the centaur grabbed the bride by the hair and attempted to carry her away. Ovid also has the other centaurs do much the same. Also drunk and following Eurydian's lead, they grabbed whatever young women they could. The house echoed with women's screams. The Lapiths and their human guests sprang to their feet. In this version, the Lapiths did not escort Eurydian outside to be punished. Instead, Theseus grabbed the bride Didamia back from Eurydian and threw a large wine bowl at the centaur's face. He fell to the ground, dead. The death of Eurydian enraged the other centaurs. They grabbed their weapons, and the entire wedding turned into a great big massive fight. Ovid provides several graphic descriptions of chaotic duels between centaurs and Lapiths. One centaur, named Amicus, tried to steal the wedding gifts. He lifted a great candlestick above his head and crashed it down into the face of a Lapith man named Celadon, smashing his head to a bloody pulp. But Amicus was in turn stabbed to death by another Lapith, who used a sharp broken table leg as a weapon. Another centaur, Gryneus, picked up the stone altar by himself and crushed two men underneath it. Grineus met his own end when a Lapith stabbed him through the eyes. One centaur never joined the fight at all, but instead lay passed out drunk on a shaggy bearskin carpet. That didn't save him, though. One of the Lapiths cut his throat. Eventually, the fight left the palace and turned into a larger battle in the countryside. Ovid's narrative has the fight in the palace spill outside and treats it all part of the same event. Homer, with his hint of a feud, suggests the battles were a later consequence of what happened at the wedding. However you interpret the timing, the drama at the wedding led to a larger war with the centaurs, called the Centauromachy. The scenes of heroes and centaurs fighting outdoors were very popular in ancient Greek vase art. As early as Hesiod's 7th century Shield of Heracles poem, we get a list of some of the major figures on both sides of the battle. Some of the important humans are Pirithous, of course, Canius, Theseus, Mopsus, and some others. 
we even get the names of some centaur warriors, who Hesiod has armed with long pine trees. Some of their names were later reused by Ovid. One of them, named Aspolos, had the gift of prophecy, and according to Ovid, he foresaw the war and unsuccessfully tried to get his centaur friends to stay away from the Lapith wedding. In other sources, many of the human warriors are consistent. Pirithus and Canius are always mentioned. Theseus is another very common name. He is typically invited to the wedding and participates in the battle afterwards. But the historian Herodotus has him not come to the wedding, instead being only called to help in the battle afterwards. In some sources, another young hero named Nestor is added to the list. As to the rest, the earliest poets, Homer and Hesiod, both give a handful of names for the Lapith heroes. Ovid enthusiastically expanded on this. His account includes the names of almost 20 specific Lapith heroes. He was probably just using them to flush out his story, though. Many of them are killed in the fighting. Ovid also includes one of the very few descriptions of a female centaur. The existence of female centaurs is a mystery. References in literature are very rare, but there are some examples of them being shown in Roman period art. In Ovid's account, there is a centaur named Solaris. He is described as being beautiful for a centaur, with a golden beard and golden hair on his head, with well-defined chest muscles and a jet-black coat of horsehair, except for his white legs and tail. He loved the female centaur, Hylonomi, who fittingly was the most beautiful of all the female centaurs, since she curled her hair and bathed twice a day. The two were always together, and Solaris and Hylonomi fought alongside each other in the centaur Nomaki battle that day. In the middle of the fighting, Solaris was hit with a stray javelin. Hylonomi embraced him as he died, caressed his wound, and put her lips to his. Once he was dead, she fell upon the same spear, and chose to die in her dead lover's arms and join him in the underworld. We don't know who killed Solaris, but in little snippets like this, Ovid covers the main Lapith hero's hand-to-hand combat. Pirithus killed five centaurs by himself, one after the other. The last one tried to flee from the Lapith king before falling off the edge of a cliff and getting impaled on a giant spike. A centaur named Aphaeus pulled a large rock from the mountainside and tried to throw it at a group of heroes. But Theseus appeared right in time, killed the centaur with his club, and then jumped on the back of another one, killing more as he went. But of all the Lapith heroes and their guests, Ovid spends the most time talking about the efforts of the Lapith hero Canius in the battle. In the middle of the fighting, Ovid says one centaur taunted Canius on how he was born a woman, and called the hero by his old name, Canis, and bellowed that the hero would always be only Canis to the centaur. The hero killed him, and then moved on to fighting more centaurs. Canius was the most formidable of all the heroes on the human side, since besides being turned into a man, Canius was also granted invulnerability by Poseidon. That meant he could attack the centaurs without fear. No normal weapon could hurt him, and with that detail in mind, other sources, Apollodorus and Hyginus, for example, also point out how Canius was able to kill many enemies. Eventually, though, Canius met his end. The surviving centaurs banded together, surrounded him, and beat him down into the earth with their pine trees. Hyginus has the centaurs use sharpened pine trees to stab Canius, but other sources suggest it was more a case of them burying the hero alive or beating him down under a pile of pine tree logs. Ovid has the hero suffocate, after failing to roll the piled logs away and unable to get a gulp of fresh air. It's an unpleasant way for a Greek hero to go, but at least Ovid has Canius turn into a bird before completely dying. In the end, following the reference in Homer's Iliad, the war ended in victory for the Lapiths. Pirithus finally drove the centaurs from their homes around Mount Pelion. On the same day, back home, his wife gave birth to a son. What that means is that in this centaur war, we're talking about a protracted series of battles here that lasted at least nine months. It must have been a devastating war. Homer says the Lapith heroes 
were among the strongest generation of earth-born mortals, and no men alive today could succeed in battle against them. War aside, Pirithous and Didamia were married, and they went on to have a son named Polypoetes. This is the son Didamia gave birth to at the very end of the Centaur War. But sadly, according to Diodorus, shortly after the birth of Polypoetes, Didamia died. Sometime later, Pirithous came to Athens to visit his friend Theseus. Pirithous arrived in Athens just after the incident between Theseus' wife Phaedra and Hippolytus. This was the incident where Phaedra falsely accused Hippolytus of raping her, and then she later killed herself. When Pirithous showed up and found out Theseus' wife was also dead, he convinced the distressed Theseus that both of them should help each other find new wives. Pirithous and Theseus came up with a plan. It was not a plan where they would both be each other's wingmen and try and find a nice girl for each other. And even though they were kings, they weren't going to put together some kind of rich bride price either and arrange a marriage with a neighbor. No, Pirithous and Theseus decided they were going to take their new wives by force. They were going to kidnap them. First, they would kidnap Helen the daughter of Zeus and a Spartan queen named Leda. Helen is a very important person in Greek mythology. Sometime later, I will cover exactly who she is, how she was born, and what she got up to later. For now, though, know that at this time, she is described as being only 10 years old, but yet already being the most beautiful woman in the world. Still, Pirithous and Theseus were planning to kidnap and marry a child, which is gross. The young Helen lived in Lacedaemon, the city also known as Sparta. According to Diodorus, Pirithous and Theseus marched to Sparta with a number of companions. So what this means is that they went with an army, ready to lay siege to Sparta, find Helen, and take off with the girl. There's no details on any battles or how the Spartans fought bravely, but were nonetheless defeated. So I like to imagine this whole scandalous event as basically a heist. In that vein, the Greek historian Plutarch says the men grabbed hold of Helen after they found her dancing in the Temple of Artemis. But no matter how it went, we're told the raid was successful. Unfortunately for Helen, she was seized and carried back to Athens. Once in Athens, Pirithous and Theseus came to an agreement. They would draw lots. The winner could marry Helen, but would have to help the other man in getting a different wife. Theseus won Helen and I don't know if it makes the whole thing any better, but he did not marry Helen right away. Instead, Theseus sent Helen to a place called Iphidna, where she was looked after by Theseus' mother, Aethra. But even though Theseus did not immediately marry Helen, he still had to help his friend Pirithous find a wife. Helen was supposed to be the most beautiful woman in the world. She was Theseus's now. But Pirithous wanted to find another woman who was just as, or even more, desirable. Well, the person he decided on was none other than Persephone, the queen of the underworld, a goddess who must be especially beautiful, as she had already been kidnapped by the god Hades. When Pirithous finally told Theseus who he had in mind to kidnap to be his own bride, the king of Athens was, rightfully, disturbed. Diodorus points out that Theseus first tried to persuade Pirithous to choose someone else, but his friend could not be convinced and Theseus was forced by his oaths to Pirithous to help him. So off to the underworld they went. There are slightly different details about what happened when they got to the house of Hades. Diodorus says the gods knew why they had come, and unimpressed with their impiety, bound them both in chains. Apollodorus says Hades and Persephone first pretended to welcome the heroes, but had them sit on a special bench. When they sat down, they forgot why they had come. Coils tied around them, and their bodies grew into the chair. Pirithous and Theseus were trapped in the underworld. For what it's worth, this whole story was controversial, even in the time of ancient Greece. The oldest reference for it is Plato's Republic, from the 4th century BC, but it undoubtedly originates from a time much older than Plato. Plato himself claims the story couldn't possibly be true, and that any hero would not have brought himself to accomplish the terrible and impious deeds. 
and that the whole story was made up by some attention-seeking poet. Centuries later, the Greek historian Plutarch tried to rationalize the story by saying the heroes did not go to the underworld after all. Instead, they went to the palace of the king in Epirus. This man had a bit of a god complex. He called himself Hades, his wife Persephone, his daughter Kore, and his pet dog Cerberus. According to Plutarch, the king forced wannabe suitors to fight the dog. When he found out Pirithous and Theseus had come to kidnap his daughter, he killed Pirithous and threw Theseus in his dungeon. If we return to the more mythological tradition, though, the two heroes were trapped in the underworld. When Heracles came through trying to complete his final labor, he was able to rescue Theseus. But he was forbidden from saving Pirithous because the Lapith king had instigated the whole adventure. So Pirithous remained chained in the underworld forevermore. His young son, Polypoetes, would grow up to become the next king and lead the fierce tribe of Lapith warriors in future battles. That's the story of Pirithous. He wasn't the only hero to fight centaurs, but his battle with them was certainly the largest. Scenes of the centaur war became very popular in Greek art and are found on vases, wall friezes, and many other artifacts. Eventually, Pirithous met his end like so many Greek heroes, because he thought he was an equal to the gods and committed the great sin of hubris. And that's all for today. Thank you for listening, and if you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend.